Hope everyone can stay as dry as possible. Um, before we do turn it over for a public health update, there's a variety of things we want to we want to talk about today. But I want to start with two bills, two pieces of legislation um, that I signed earlier today. This morning, I signed HB 1264, which strengthens our clean drinking water standards, uh, ensuring we have some of the strongest standards in the nation. This has been a priority of my administration uh, from the very beginning, um, partially my, my own personal bias, if you will, my background in, in being an environmental engineer. I'm, I'm quite partial to these issues, but we do have a PFAS problem in the state, and we've always said uh, we don't want a problem to, be, uh, to become a crisis, which is why we created the Clean Drinking Water Fund uh, early on, uh, maybe about two or three years ago, hundreds of millions of dollars from the uh, uh, MBTE settlement that goes to actually building pipes and ensuring that every time you turn on your faucet, uh, you put your glass under that faucet and you hand it to your child, you got to know that the government really did its job well uh, and you're ensuring that, that that drinking water is safe. So it has been a priority of ours and this bill really strengthens those standards. Um, but also another very important provision of this bill is it's providing financial support to municipalities across the state for their water systems and their wastewater treatment plants uh, that are often, if you will, the victim of some of these these uh, very tough standards. Standards are very important, but it does require a lot of upgrades, a lot of upgrades with piping, upgrades with uh, filtration materials, whatever it might be. And uh, so we don't want to create an unfunded mandate. We're providing a lot of potential support uh, for those municipalities that are really going to be on the front lines of this. And uh, and obviously, I, I also want to take a moment and thank uh, Senator Chuck Morris and Senator Dick Hinch. Um, they have just led the fight on this for the last two or three years. They've been on the front lines and making sure not just this bill, but some of the other legislation uh, that we've been working on has passed. Um, they've just done a great job uh, really understanding that this does impact everyday individuals uh, every time we, we turn our drinking faucets on. Another bill that I just have a personal, uh, real personal connection with is a bill, a House bill, um, yes, it was a House bill, uh, 1135. I don't remember the numbers too often. There's, there's a lot of them. Uh, the important part of this one is there's a, a variety of different pieces in this, but this is uh, one that really ensures that um, issues like the Holocaust and genocide are built into our curriculum in schools. I've had the, the honor and the privilege of um, this past year, not so much over the COVID, but uh, the COVID crisis, but prior to the COVID crisis, um, I spent a lot of time with a, a good friend, Kati Preston. She's a Holocaust survivor. She spent a lot of her time over the past few years going to schools, talking to students about her experience, what it is. She has an amazing, amazing story in a variety of different ways. Um, but it's one that looks to the future and always trying to build on the future. What are we leaving um, for our children? What are we making sure we instill? And what stories uh, that are important lessons are not forgotten? Uh, and that's a big, this is, this is really a big one. And to be able to sign this into law, uh, to, um, as she put it earlier today, little old New Hampshire uh, doing what a lot of these big states uh, have never been able to accomplish. Um, everyone really came together. Um, the Jewish Federation of New Hampshire, Kati, a lot of advocates from different faith-based communities came forward and really made sure that we got this into the curriculum. This bill also does a, a few other things, but two others that I want to mention are uh, Specialist Mark Dakota. Um, Specialist Mark Dakota from Waterville Valley uh, was one of the first individuals uh, we lost early on in the war on terror many, many years ago. And so this bill will allow Route 49 uh, to be named after, after Mark. Um, yeah, and the other uh, piece really is with 125 uh, down in Brentwood. Steve Arkell, Officer Steve Arkell of the Brentwood Police Department, um, who lost his life in the line of duty. Um, boy, probably five, six, seven years now. It's been, it's been a while. I've gotten to know both those families very well, but B Route 125 uh, in that area will be uh, named for Officer Steve Arkell. So, um, you know, they're just lines in a bill, but they really are impactful, and I think it, it highlights, um, in New Hampshire at least, uh, we want to not just remember individuals that put themselves on the line, um, but really cherish them and honor them uh, for everything that, that they give and honor those that will come after them as well. Um, so with that, I think, if Commissioner Chimet, we'll do a public health update. Thank you, Governor. So this afternoon we are, uh, are announcing 25 new cases of COVID-19 for a total of 6,318, one new hospitalization for a total of 681, and three new deaths for a total of 405. One of the three deaths were uh, someone that uh, resided in a long-term care facility. 
For long-term care facility outbreak status update, we have no new outbreaks to report. We have no closures to report of outbreaks. Um, but today we are announcing a new partnership with Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center to take over our long-term care facility surveillance program. So beginning next week, our surveillance program with our long-term care facilities will be transitioning from Mako Laboratories to Dartmouth-Hitchcock. This is part of what we talked about for the last week or so, and that is keeping some of our testing capacity and increasing our testing capacity within the state of New Hampshire. When we do that and we support our healthcare facilities and our labs um, to do additional testing and increased capacity, we retain control over quality, we t retain control over cost. So it's really important. What we've seen over the last couple of weeks is that as the national picture of COVID changes, it impacts our turnaround times at our national labs. They are great partners. Quest and LabCorp have been uh, standing next to us right from the beginning of this pandemic, but right now their their resources are going into different areas of the country. We will continue to use our commercial lab partners, but as much as we can, we will continue to try to build capacity within New Hampshire. The other thing that we want to uh, announce today is uh, something called the Support Persons Program for Acute Care Hospitals. So for the past several months, uh, our, our patients, our community members, our hospitals have contemplated the risk and benefit of allowing visitation during hospital stays. And we've heard about this um, both at the department, I'm sure the governor's office, the, the individual's hospitals, of family members really having a hard time when they bring their loved one to the hospital, either to the emergency room or for an inpatient stay, and they're not able to go into the hospital with them. So collaboratively, uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, New Hampshire Hospital Association, and all of our hospital partners got together to put together a set of guidelines around on our non-COVID patients uh, support person program. So what that really means is that, you know, if you ha are going to the hospital or if you have a family member going to the hospital, either emergency room or inpatient, you will be asked now to designate a support person. Um, th that's a person that can advocate for you or uh, just be there for emotional support, be a caregiver. And we feel it's really, really important. The hospitals, uh, our community members, and the department feel it's very important that people have the opportunity to have that support person at their bedside, either in an emergency or during an, um, an inpatient stay. And that designation will be for one person. So it's not going to be that a different person can visit every single day, um, but we're going to designate one person. Now, every hospital, depending on what's going on in the community, has the ability to expand that program and allow for more visitation. And we also give the flexibility to the hospital that if if the picture in the community or even in their ER changes, they need that flexibility to pull back. So if in one evening they see three or four or six people come into their e emergency room with respiratory symptoms, they, they, they need to be able to say, okay, hold up a second. We need to pair back a little bit until we figure out what's going on. So we always want to leave that decision making at the bedside, which is what we're doing with this program, um, but very much encouraging and all the hospitals are on board, allowing everybody to have at least one support person at their bedside uh, during a hospital stay. So I think that's all I have for updates. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Commissioner. And I, I just want to I thank the Commissioner very publicly. That uh, Working on that last piece she was talking about where folks can just have an advocate or somebody um, you know, speaking on their behalf in those uh, times of going into an emergency room can bring a lot, lot of anxiety. Um, we've heard a lot of stories of individuals that, you know, they, they're under a lot of stress. Maybe they're having heart issues or whatever it is. They forget what medication that they might be on when they're asked questions. They forget, you know, what their other medical history is or their situation. So to have somebody with them there as that advocate, I think, is, is so important. I just want to thank the commissioner. That was not an easy um, uh, uh, I think process to work through all the hospitals and I want to thank all the hospitals for also um, getting on board understanding it and really um, helping make it uh, make these first steps a reality um, to make sure that process works works very smoothly um, a couple uh, quick updates on a few of the things that we're, we've also put out today uh, and then we'll open it up for questions um, 
tomorrow, uh, the, we've been talking about the self-employment fund. And tomorrow, individuals that um, uh, applied for the fund will receive an email from the state notifying them of either their approval or maybe a request for more information, uh, a notice of non-eligibility if there was some reason why they, they weren't qual they, you know, applied but for some reason don't qualify. Um, and uh, so uh, there will be literally thousands of applicants that will get emails from across the state. Um, approximately uh, the initial amount going out the door is at least $26 million, uh, but then there'll be a lot of other applications because the self-employment gets, the self-employment requests are a little more complicated. So we want to, again, take the time and go through a, a variety of them individually and making sure that we're getting it right on eligibility and whatnot. But uh, the initial $26 million award notifications will go out tomorrow, uh, likely with, with more coming in the future. So that's just a, another great process. <clears throat> um, one of the programs we talked about, uh, I talked about last week, uh, was the investment in the future fund, and um, this was the summer programming dollars that we allocated to a variety of different areas to really make sure that kids um, had uh, programs available to them um, that traditionally may uh, exist in the summer, but because of the COVID pandemic or, epi or pandemic and epidemic, uh, the programs might have been shortened or reduced or maybe even non-existent at this point. So we wanted to provide those supports so these organizations could really staff up uh, and allow that opportunity because we know that that safe socialization is so important for our kids, um, especially after all the months of remote learning. Um, we want to avoid those issues of long-term uh, and the adverse issues of long-term isolation and social isolation. So after talking to the Health, Health and Human Services uh, group and uh, folks over at Gopher to find ways to increase summer and fall activities for children across New Hampshire. We, we established this Invest in the Future Fund with about $4.5 million of CARES Act funding. And today we're announcing the launch of the first of those programs. It's called Empowering Youth Program. Um, it's, it's a part of the Invest in the Future Fund. We'll, it'll use about $2 million in CARES Act funds to increase summer program for middle and high school age students across the Granite State. Um, again, the goal of the programs isn't just to provide uh, funding for things like day camps or recreational sports and other recreational programs, uh, but it's really to bridge those programs as we enter the school year. So we're not just taking the summer in an isolated chunk. We want to create a continuum uh, of opportunities for these kids uh, that extend as we finish out the summer um, and then move into the, to the next year. Um, the application period opens today. Um, uh, it'll close on Monday, August 17th, so there's plenty of time for organizations to apply. And these organizations, again, would be things like the Boys and Girls Club, um, Recreational Youth Sports Programs, YMCA, Girls Inc., um, different athletic associations across the state. So there's a variety of different organizations that provide these types of programs, summer programs for kids that will now be able to bridge into the new school year. Uh, you can go to gopher.nh.gov um, and e there'll either be a button uh, for Empower Youth uh, or something you can click on there to get into the application process. But again, it, kind of just following on an announcement we, we made a couple weeks ago, uh, the Gopher team did a great job getting the application up and running in just a matter of a couple weeks and, and we're off and running. Um, every day counts when it comes to summer programs for these kids. We just always want to provide that opportunity. Um, also, yesterday I released um, the uh, initial report uh, and the recommendations from the governor's COVID-19 equity response team. Uh, the group worked very hard, and obviously I want to first thank them for, for their service, uh, for what they, they put together. Um, it's a very important baseline and key first step. There'll be a lot of work, I think, that, that builds on the, the, ground that, that, uh, the ground that they have laid for us. Uh, and while our office continues to review the report, we have identified numerous recommendations that are currently either underway or that we can, can prompt an immediate response uh, from the state. And we'll continue to work with members of the equity response team as well as the Governor's Council on Diversity and Inclusion. The Governor's Council on Diversity and Inclusion is a group I created uh, about two or three years ago now, um, uh, which again deals with a variety of issues, really em embracing and, and allowing the stakeholders and, and individuals to come forward in a variety of different communities for on a variety of different issues having to do with diversity and inclusion. And so uh, we're really empowering them to take some of the next steps uh, with this uh, with this report to find out um, the timing, what might need legislative approval, what might need uh, additional funding approval. Uh, take a second and third layer look at the data. Um, we've just been able to kind of touch the, the surface of the data and it's it's clear that there is a, a response is needed. Uh, but we want to look even deeper into that data to make sure that we're being, um, I think, as, as detailed as we can with our response. But among the recommendations in the report that are, are either currently underway or achievable, things that we can, we can do immediately, um, um, one, uh, there's, I'm going to give you a little list here. 
I apologize. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't we didn't create a slide, but um, we wanted to at least get some of the information out. But some of these ideas I, I thought were very, very good. First, robust disparity data dashboards. What does that mean? Uh, really having a dashboard, and we've already created the the initial forms of it that look at um, through the COVID nineteen epidemic and maybe and making it uh, more expansive into the healthcare models that really look at the racial disparity uh, that might exist for different ailments, different conditions, and different aspects uh, of our healthcare system. Uh, Increasing community testing. Obviously, we're always trying to increase our testing capacity, but especially in, in some of the smaller cities um, and, and areas where, again, we know that either from a language barrier um, or uh, an economic, potential economic barriers may exist, communication barriers that are just inherently there. We want to make sure we're being very proactive in those areas to not just increase the community testing, but the communication that comes with that to make sure that folks understand the opportunities that are available to them. Uh, we want to ensure that testing sites have written protocols for community outreach and demographic identifier data. So in other words, we want to be collecting that demographic identifier data. If we don't collect the data, we, we can't really understand and find out where some of the holes and gaps in our system are. So we want to encourage uh, as many folks that are going through that process to, to be able to uh, be willing to give that, that information and data so we can use it, I think, in a robust and, and productive way. Um, conducting a, a equity review analysis and ensuring healthy food access. Healthy food access is a big one. Uh, we've already uh, allocated up to $5 million into New Hampshire's food bank, the centralized location that works with hundreds of food pantries across the state. Again, those that uh, might be uh, marginalized economically, that uh, again, that uh, don't come into what we, I guess we traditionally call the mainstream healthcare mix. We want them into that mainstream healthcare mix and we want to find out where those barriers exist uh, to make sure that everyone has uh, the appropriate opportunity for it. Um, in deploying COVID, the COVID-19 res response community health workers, making sure again we have the workforce there. So when we make investments into some of these communities. We expand opportunities with better communication. You need the workforce there as well, right? A program is only as good as, as those that, are, that, that can actually deliver it. So making sure we have adequate workforce in those areas, making sure we have workforce uh, that, have, um, that can speak multi-languages, right? Because the language barrier is one that we're realizing is it's a, it's a real factor for folks that if they don't understand exactly the opportunities that are there, they're very hesitant uh, to come out, especially now that um, you know, we had the stay-at-home order, there was a lot of isolation. We've got to really communicate in every means possible and go that extra mile for a lot of these folks to make sure not just that we're collecting data, but most importantly, they're getting the health care that they truly that that, that they truly re deserve. Um. And then isolation and, um, and quarantine housing support, which we're currently doing. Uh, we need to do more of it, but just making sure that if you do need to be I isolated or quarantined, if you do test positive, whatever those issues might be, that we have support systems in place for, for housing or additional housing supports. And so we think that's something that we can move on uh, fairly quickly. And again, we'll continue. This is just the first step, and we're going to continue to work both with the equity team and the uh, Commission on Diversity and Inclusion to make sure that we're taking that second and third level of detail. We're going after everything we can. There are a lot, a lot of other recommendations in that report. All of them uh, are definitely worth visiting and, and seeing again where and when we can uh, we can implement them. Um, it's one of those issues where um, every day that you wait you're, you're missing an opportunity. So we wanted to move quickly on a few of these initial steps uh, but there's obviously a lot more a lot more work to do. The last thing I want to touch upon is something I, I came across and that really hit the news a lot uh, this past 24 hours and that's federal relief. <clears throat> um, a, a lot of folks have seen Congress is working on another relief package bill. We've been told that they've been, uh, we were told they were going to be working on this bill back in June. That got delayed. Now it's into July, and they're finally getting to working on it, and we're appreciative of that. Um, but one thing I, I got to just express a little frustration. When the CARES Act passed in March, we fought very hard between the time that the act passed to the time that the dollars were allocated to ensure that states would have all the flexibility in the world to spend those dollars um, as they see fit. And, and one of those requests was to make sure that states could uh, use those funds uh, to backfill lost state revenues or munis municipal revenues. Most importantly, we wanted to help a lot of the cities and towns. And we were told emphatically across the board, no, absolutely not. Uh, there would be another stimulus package that included those types of provisions. Um, they were very clear that the, re the CARES Act money that the state received uh, was to be spent quickly. It was relief money. It was to go out strictly for relief. Uh, and we understood that. And we understood that mission. And, and we played exactly uh, by the rules, so to say. Um, now, the, the, the frustration, I guess, uh, to, to express a little bit is the latest draft we've seen of the stimulus bill out of Congress uh, really pulls the plug 
on Washington's promise uh, to support states. Instead, it really changes the rules for money, frankly, that we've already spent, and, and it's a terrible idea. It really is. Uh, what it's really saying is we told you to spend the money fast, focus on relief efforts, and you couldn't use it to backfill funds. But now at the end of the game, we're telling you we're, we're going to change the rules and we're going to tell you that it's more flexible. But it's really not because we did exactly um, those states that were hit hard, as we were. New Hampshire was in New England. Uh, states especially were hit very hard early on. We spent that money exactly as we should have on PPE, on testing capacity, and all these different opportunities, economic relief, exactly as the rules specified. Uh, and my push is this. We need Washington to, to understand the promises that were made to states, uh, those commitments, and we want them to come through uh, with some level of funding. We don't need trillions of dollars. We really don't. But some level of funding to, to fulfill that commitment that they've made to states, um, this idea that, we're gonna, that they're going to change the rules, unfortunately, that, that's, that's typical Washington, but it will have a severe impact, not just here in New Hampshire, but all across the country, all across the country. So we understand there have to be guidelines. We understand that there's tax dollars at, uh, um, at risk here. Um, but if they were going to, I guess my, guess my point is, if they're going to have this rule in the first place, maybe they should have told us back in March. Um, and, and what you're really doing is creating an unfair process. States that spent the money aggressively, really attacked their COVID crisis, really had the, the biggest part of the COVID problem, uh, are now at the biggest disadvantage, right? States that didn't have, didn't and, and haven't had as big of a, of a COVID issue have more money left in the till and are effectively being rewarded. So, um, you know, I just want to really encourage Washington to dig deep. Uh, they have to make some very, very tough decisions. Uh, but from the, the governor's point of view, again, we acted very quickly. We had a great team here at Gopher. We did it really, really well. We did it right. Um, and we just want to make sure that those opportunities that were, um, you know, committed to the state are, are fulfilled on because it's not about the state. It's not about government. It's really about making sure those funds are going to be, be available uh, for the citizens that, that need it the most. I guess with that, we can open up for questions. How much money would you like, um, and is it from this municipalities that you're um, seeing, um, and what kind of um, losses have they suffered? That um, Sure. Well, we, we understand the budget deficit here, and again, I'm not saying that the, the, the uh, Washington, D.C. has to cover all of our budget losses, uh, but it was always understood that they would be there for not just the state, but cities and towns. That was, uh, that was the package. It was... Um, uh, municipal state and municipal support uh, for the lost revenues. Um, if you remember this, it's the state and the municipalities that followed the CDC guidance that you know made a lot of the restrictions and, and took on um, I think some of the toughest decisions knowing that there would be very severe economic losses to themselves and in their communities uh, following that that guidance and I think that's what the basis of that commitment to this the states were so uh, when we went back and realized that they, we didn't have that flexibility first we went to all the cities and towns and told them look we don't have the flexibility but you can use the, the CARES Act money for for COVID related funds uh, and with the confidence that that more dollars would be coming in I think there's still time I think there's a lot of time to to um, for the House and the Senate to work something out to be sure um, but for I just to be clear from from our point of view it was made I mean I spoke to the Treasury Secretary directly I spoke to members of Congress and the Senate directly and it was always understood and, and appreciated that the, a relief bill is a relief bill and a stimulus bill is a stimulus bill and you know supports for cities and towns in the state would be coming in the stimulus bill so we just hope it gets put back in I believe they're all in favor of of, uh, of moving forward but I again we got to hope that they can work with their counterparts in both the House and the Senate on both sides of the aisle to, to try to get that adv advocacy done. Governor, it was many, many weeks ago you were calling on the President to invoke the Defense Production Act uh, when it came to things like ventilators and things like that. Now that we're kind of scraping along with the testing and trying to cobble together our own testing capacity, is it time to perhaps call on the President to invoke that Defense Production Act in the effort of creating more testing capacity so we can get test turnaround faster here? Well, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't think anyone is, is holding back on increasing testing capacity, getting the reagents uh, manufactured as fast as possible. If you have the ability to manufacture testing reagents right now, um, that's just a huge, you'd be doing it, I think. There's just a huge economic opportunity to do it. Um, so I don't know if it's the, I don't want to speak directly to the Defense Production Act and all the pros and cons that that may bring. Um, I will say thank you to all the different companies who have stepped up and changed their models of production, whether it's to make masks or make medical devices or, or maybe even get into the testing device field. Um, I think I have every confidence that I've heard across the country from the manufacturers themselves as well as the administration that they're trying to make this stuff as fast as, as possible, understanding that the, the demand on it is very high. I don't know if invoking a Defense Production Act increases that anymore. There's every incentive in the world to already do it. Um, so I, I'm not sure. I, I, I guess I just wouldn't be the one to, to answer that question to, to determine whether that would, uh, would have, you know, 
beneficial results. So you think the market can solve the problem eventually? I think the market is doing everything it possibly can. I don't know if it, I, I, I'm not going to promise that this problem gets solved. I'm not going to speak on behalf of the entire American market that the problem gets solved. But I, I think there's such incentive to do it. There's so much money out there, frankly. The government is putting up a lot of money to accelerate and, and fast track everything from vaccines to testing materials, new testing devices, mobile testing devices, rapid testing devices. And we've seen a lot of them come online in just the past uh, few months. And they're, again, trying to make those reagents. It's really the reagents that are, that are the biggest limiting factor. And they're trying to make it as fast as they possibly can. There's every incentive to do it because I don't know any state that doesn't want to buy more of it. So what's your level of confidence that we're going to see the turnaround time on tests go down in, in, um, in time for that back to school period where we're theoretically going to see either another spike or more people requesting tests? I'm not, um, I'm not incredibly confident that the turnaround time drops precipitously from seven days back down to three and four days um, because I just think the demand is going to remain to stay very high across the country. And then if those, these numbers that we see in Florida and Arizona and Texas start to plateau, if that happens in the next few weeks, that'll be about the time that the testing capacity really ramps up for schools. So uh, as one thing gives, another thing comes in. So um, I, don't, I, I, I wouldn't stand here and say I'm very confident that turnaround times are going to be reduced. Um, I hope they do, obviously, and, and we pray that they do. Um, and we're going to try, as Commissioner Chevinet alluded to, we're trying everything we can to be more self-sufficient with our own testing, as is every state, frankly. Um, but I don't think there's any guarantees that, oh, don't worry, testing turnaround times are coming from seven days down to three. No, I, I, I mean, I hope they don't go higher. I guess that's my, my, the best thing I could say at this point, unfortunately. And one follow on that, uh, or maybe Commissioner Shibin, I can weigh in. In addition to the group testing that will theoretically mm -hmm. kind of build in some capacity, when, I mean, you said you've been trying to get more machines or more testing mm -hmm. capacity. When will you know when you might be able to get those or not? Sure. Because I guess that's the aspect of the Defense Production Act. If the Pentagon can start making these things or take over the process and, and blow the market away and mm -hmm. just give them to you, wouldn't that be the best way to do it? Yeah, so, uh, the, uh, for example, the long-term care testing devices, 15,000. I was told just the other day by the vice president there's 15,000 of them that will be shipped out to virtually every long-term care facility in the country um, over the next five weeks. So I think they're going to focus on the areas of highest need and, and highest COVID rates first. They're just prioritizing. I couldn't tell you exactly how that priority pr prioritization will go other than to say they're focusing on the highest need areas. Uh, but that's over the next five weeks you'll get devices in virtually every long-term care facility. Now, again, if they can come with the reagents and the ability to keep up with pace that would be wonderful but um, so they are moving and, and we saw it early on with the Abbott rapid test and I expressed my frustration when we only got like 50 was it I think 50 uh, cartridges but that has drastically increased and I've talked to the folks at Abbott directly about that and we've been able to get a lot more of those cartridges so that's been great and I imagine with the with this device it's a different device going to the long-term care facilities something similar will happen we won't get a whole lot to start but it will really ramp up you know in, in the following weeks and over time you just take more and more pressure out of that system. Governor, will you, with regard to changing the rules um, you're not indicating that you've made any expenses that you cannot that won't be eligible. Oh no 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 we no to be sure we I, we have a couple hundred million dollars left over oh at least if not more. But in terms of revenue, if there is no money for revenue shortfalls at the state and local level, what is our budget and what are local budgets going to look like? What's going to have to happen in order? To sure. I can't speak directly to local budgets. I think there's an assessment going on now. A lot of folks have, are, have just paid their property taxes over the past few weeks, and I think a lot of those towns are, are getting all their numbers in line on looking at not just what their revenues are, but where their budgets will be. And we'll have some better information on that in, in, in I think, just a, a few short weeks. Department of Revenue, they basically bring their data up to the Department of Revenue Administration, and, and um, we can report out on that, as we know. I've, as I presented here a few weeks ago, the initial numbers look to be well over $500 million. Uh, revenues have come in much better over the past month um, and I think we're probably more closer in the four to four hundred fifty million dollar range maybe even better we don't want to get uh, too too ahead of ourselves one way or another we can we will manage through but understand that if I have we have to use all the rest of our cares act money to replace revenue well we're just cutting ourselves short on other opportunities that that those dollars could have gone to whether it's testing materials or PPE schools whatever it might be so um, you know you, there's I, I appreciate there's only so many dollars in the till but you know we've been keeping back a reserve fund expecting this next surge in the fall, expecting the, the need at a localized level to come, and we wanted to make sure that we are there for them. And we fully anticipate, but those opportunities may be shortened 
if, again, we, the, the, the federal government doesn't come through. And again, it just goes back to, to expectations, right? One of the most important things you can do in a, in a position of leadership is set your expectations realistically. And if you exceed them down the road, wonderful. But, you know, don't say you can, you're going to do X. You know, set the rules of the game here and then come back four months later. I mean, if you remember, they, they told us we had to spend the CARES Act money by December. Like, they really said, you've got to get this money out. It's relief money. Get it out quickly. And we did a great job of that. And now to come back with a few months to go and say, oh, by the way, you can use it for this. It sounds like it's being more flexible, but in a way, it's, it's forcing our hand a little bit to reassess re, uh, all of the, those priorities, those needs, how that will be weighed out. And it, it probably, uh, you know, if we were to use money in that area and to help cities and towns, we always want to be able to do that. Um, that would take away from something else that we would potentially be investing in. But we have more than enough money in terms of what we've allocated for, to be sure. Nothing will go short. But we, it just means that we're going to have to dip into these reserve accounts potentially to help uh, other folks on the local level. Uh, look, we don't know where the final bill is going to come out, but um, I don't want to sit back and wait and see and, and find out that they didn't get it right without at least advocating a little bit. Uh, that um, I, I was texting with uh, Congresswoman Custer this morning. I expressed my frustrations um, and said, look, anything you, you folks can do down there to, to advocate to get this done the right way, um, fight hard. It means a lot. It really does, not just to the state and government, but really to the individuals that are going to need these funds ultimately. I have a question for uh, Commissioner Chabonet sure. about um, deaths in uh, long-term care facilities that involve employees. I know we've talked about this in the past. I wondered. You have a list that says there are seven people who have died um, who worked at long care facilities. Can we just know the names of the facilities, not obviously the people? We have a list of, uh, we have a number, seven, I think it is right now, of health care workers, not necessarily long term care workers, right? So they're health care workers that have died throughout COVID. Some of the distinction that, you know, we d it doesn't mean that that person contracted COVID in their workplace. It could be someone that is a healthcare worker, a nurse that contracted COVID at a family barbecue, but we still label them as a healthcare worker. So um, part of the problem is, is that if I gave you a name of a facility, right? And that facility had one employee die in the last year, because employee death is not that common in any healthcare facility. You can constructively identify who that person was and what that person died of. And we take privacy uh, to the highest degree when it comes to public health, and um, we would never release information that would allow anybody to constructively identify someone that had COVID. And, um we spoke on Tuesday about uh, deaths in workplaces, and you yeah. said a handful. Can you be more specific about it? Um I, I believe the question on Tuesday was around outbreaks or clusters of illnesses in workplaces, not necessarily deaths. Um, um, I, I would assume that anybody that, you know, is not retired or living in a long-term care facility, you know, anybody would have a workplace. So it does not mean that um, because I'm an employee of uh, a retail store that I contracted COVID at that retail store. So, you know, a lot of these questions centered around some of the inquiries from OSHA, right? And OSHA investigates deaths in workplaces. And it is up to the individual workplace to look at that employee death and determine whether that's a workplace related death. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that, that they're going to report it to OSHA if they've done an investigation and they've determined that this person was a close contact of someone else that had COVID and that it had nothing to do with the workplace. We don't investigate those, that is and we don't report those to OSHA. That is completely between the employer and the federal agency. So you are completely out, um, you don't have any communication with OSHA related to COVID. We, we, do, we have no, um, we have no authority over that and we don't have any obligations. Now OSHA or the Department of Labor can reach out and want to do confirmation with us if they receive um, a complaint or they receive a request for information, they can reach out. But honestly, we still have the same privacy issues, right? We, we want to make sure that we're respecting the privacy of the individuals that have COVID-19. Um, they have authority to go into the workplace and say, tell us more about this employee death. So they can get their information from the employer. They do not need to come through the public health division to get that information.
I think we're going to take a few uh, on the phone, if that's okay. The next question comes from Kathy with Associated Press. Kathy, please go ahead. Hi, thank you. I have two questions. Uh, when would the hospital advocate uh, guidelines uh, start? And also, um, yesterday, NEA New Hampshire, the teachers' union, had put out a series of recommended principles uh, before school starts. One of them is that the state shall reimburse each district for all necessary PPE, physical materials, and other resources necessary for a state reopening in a timely manner. Would that be manageable? Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about the advocate? So the support person in the acute care hospitalization, I would say that, you know, it definitely is effective immediately. Many of the hospitals have been doing this. So I, I just want to highlight that, that every hospital has, has been flexible and have been employing this type of program to a different degree um, for the last several weeks to last month, depending on what's going on in the community. I think we really felt that there were, there were a couple hospitals because there was some inconsistency in how it was being um, done, we felt it was really important to put consistent guidelines in place so everybody in the state can expect a very consistent approach to this. So um, for an effective date, I would say it's effective immediately, but I think what you'll find is a lot of people that have accessed health care has had the ability to have a support person over the last couple of weeks. Thank you. And as for the question on um, the, the NEA and, and their, you know, sending lists of demands, I'll, I'll, I'll simply say um, we've, the state has and will continue to provide funds as necessary for COVID-related costs uh, in, in education. Um, as we've reported a few times now, there was a, an initial f approximately f just over $40 million put out to all of the school districts uh, that they could use for COVID-related costs. There's dollars that we've put out to the cities and towns that they could use for COVID-related costs. Uh, and if there are additional dollars that may be necessary, uh, we can work with individual towns. I, the only, I guess the only hesitation I would say there is that, you know, we don't want a small school district building up, you know, millions and millions of mass, stockpiles of millions and millions of mass. So um, we'll work with them to make sure that they understand, I think, what their needs are and making sure that they are fulfilling those needs based on the guidelines uh, that the state has provided, the CDC has provided, and, um, you know, any finalized guidelines that may, may come at the local level as well. Hi. Um, earlier when the news release went out about the broadband expansion program, the anticipated contract start date was mid-July. So what can you tell us about response to the program and, uh, and projects that may be funded under that program? Sure, great question. So I created a $50 million broadband fund knowing that uh, working, working remotely or education, remote education, uh, may continue on into the indefinite future um, in a variety of different ways. And so we wanted to make sure we were in making those investments and upgrading the system so people had that connectivity. Um, we'll have a final uh, announcement next, I believe next week, concerning um, where uh, those contracts uh, you know, laid out. Uh, we're one of the only states in the country that has even tried this, t this type of program with CARES Act funds. Um, and we worked it, I think we designed it just right. Most states have asked us how we did it, frankly. Um, but once again, I'm very proud to say that our team at Gopher has really led the charge. Um, the biggest challenge was the idea that we're going to get contracts out and really put shovels on the ground and build fiber optic networks, sometimes to individual homes on the level of thousands and thousands of homes in just the next few months. And so there were a lot of opportunities, I think, that simply because the, t the, the dollars have to be spent by federal law, the projects have to be done by December. So I think a lot of potential projects that sh probably would have loved to have been part of this fund could not apply because they simply required more time, either because of pole connections, you know, working it out, um, you know, when you, when you have to make a connection into a pole, that actually creates a, a lot of time because the poles are owned by somebody, the fiber is owned by somebody, the abutting uh, uh, properties have to be notified because you're actually doing work on their properties, even a pole is in their property. So we realized very quickly it got very, very complicated. So the projects that we'll, we'll be announcing next week are really kind of that low-hanging fruit, the easiest projects to do 
will all 50 million of the fund be spent? I, I don't think so. I mean, I think we, I, we created, we, I created the fund to make sure that no one got left behind. I'm not sure ultimately how many dollars actually get spent. I know that um, the Public Utility Commission and the Office of Strategic Initiatives have been working very diligently. But any a project that, that can be done in the time frame uh, is, going to be, is going to be done. And so um, we'll have some more details in terms of actually how many connections there are and how much money is being spent. They're still finalizing that. But I think that was really one of the biggest hesitations because it had to move so quickly. A lot of folks um, you know, couldn't, just couldn't apply. Their projects weren't, weren't going to qualify. Um, there were certain projects that, um, frankly, there were, I, I, I won't give uh, too many specific examples, but I, I did see there, were, there might have been some projects that just didn't, a million dollar project that only impacted 10 homes, let's say. So there was also a cost benefit analysis done on some of that where if it just wasn't, didn't really make sense and a good use of the taxpayer dollars. But f for the most, uh, the far majority of the projects, I believe, were ones that were just the low hanging fruit that, that could be done. And, and my hats off to the team. I know they worked very, very hard to, to achieve that and they are working on those final contracts now. Hi, Governor. Just two questions. Um, first, central to the equity uh, response team to report is how other social factors like employment, income, where someone lives determine health outcomes. So how might those findings shape other priorities for you going forward? And then secondly, will the state be reporting outbreaks of COVID-19 in institutions that serve children such as schools, daycares, and camps, like in the same way it has for long-term care facilities? Sure. So um, the, ex the equity response report that came out today, as we uh, discussed earlier, had a variety of different um, um, ideas and, and recommendations in it. Um, those that I, I touched upon a few of them briefly just to give a bit of a, a, a taste of uh, what we can do short term. Some of the longer term issues um, that you bring up, I think we're going to lean on the Diversity and Inclusion Council. They're the ones that have the greatest amount of stakeholder input. The, the equity response team was fantastic. We found five individuals in the state that are really on the front lines of that issue. But I think one thing that was discussed in the report is the need for more stakeholder input, a, a, a better, uh, more informative, law ongoing process. And that's why I think where the Diversity and Inclusion Council will come in to really take up some of those issues. Um, and then looking at what they define as kind of that, um, the immediate priorities, the longer term issues, we'll kind of lean on them to really be the experts and the and, and the understanding of of how and and how best to go about achieving these results and, and what needs to be prioritized again they're just they're on the front lines with the real stakeholders of of those issues um, in terms of the COVID-19 if there's potential uh, uh, it would be different if there were an outbreak I think versus a, an individual case within a school um, I'm going to turn it over to the commissioner So it really depends on where the the contact tracing investigation and the disease investigation leads us. Um, I don't think there is an intent to publish a list of every uh, every school, every daycare, um, or ed every child care center that has that has a cluster of illness or an outbreak of illness. But what I can tell you is that through the, the disease investigation and through the infection investigation, if we, if we get to a point where, where we've, through our contact tracing, we've determined that we are not able to identify every close contact to a child or a teacher or, or, or whomever in, a, in any particular setting, then we would do a notification to the public as we have done all along. Um, so I don't, I don't think that it's going to be uh, a widespread notification but it really it really depends on where the fall leads us you know it, it, it really depends on how many we see how many impact the public how much notification needs to be made um, our hope in in what we've seen repeatedly is that through our, our disease investigation we have in the, for the vast majority of our cases we have been able to identify all the close contacts of the people involved and therefore there wasn't a need to do a public notification and that's what we would like to see continue through the fall the only thing I'll add to that is um, one of the the top priorities of the guidance document that the state put out was the implementation of a communications team first and foremost and a communications plan at a localized level so again schools were communicating with parents and teachers on a variety of different issues as we go through the the COVID epidemic again it's just kind of building off I think what we're trying to do at the state level is be very transparent with what we do obviously maintaining um, 
individualized uh, privacy issues around this. These are health care issues, of course. Um, and again, working with public health and the de uh, uh, Department of Health and Human Services, um, uh, kind of the greater com um, communication response teams there, allow making sure that the, the individual communities know what they can say and, and when they can say it. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is for Commissioner Shivanet. Uh, the chief of the state's Bureau of Infectious Disease Control confirmed on Wednesday that Rochester's numbers for current COVID-19 cases have not been, up had not been updated since late May or early June, resulting in faulty reporting for almost seven weeks. Do you have any explanation of how this happened? And can you tell us whether you suspect other cities and towns may have also suffered uh, more than uh, a month long, uh, fault, uh, months, uh, oh, more than a month of faulty data? And also, can you tell us if policies will be put in place to ensure this won't happen again? And lastly, uh, if you can't answer that this afternoon, can you please have someone uh, circle back and get back to me to answer these questions. Thank you. Do you want to? Sure. Okay. Thanks for the question. Um, I think that what we'll do is we'll we'll formulate a, a more comprehensive response to your question. Um, I don't I don't have an answer to that. What I can tell you is that there's a lot of systems working, and can an error happen? Absolutely, an error can happen. And anytime an error happens, then we put uh, you know uh, corrective action plans in place to make sure it doesn't happen again. But the one specific to Rochester, I think what we'll do is we'll formulate a, a more comprehensive response and, and circle back to you uh, later today or tomorrow. Great. Sure. Um, I know you've left it up to the districts. And I think, as you know, a lot of parents may still be concerned about going back in the fall, whether it comes to the flu, cold season uh, in the fall potential for more cases, why not wait until maybe after Christmas break, for example, to give schools more time, parents more time? You mean uh, the idea of doing remote learning across the state for, um, I, I think and I, I would agree with everyone from the National Pediatrics Association, our own Department of Public Health, um, the parents across the state that who uh, overwhelmingly say kids really need to be back in the classrooms and if there's a way to do it safely uh, with the guidance documents we've put out, um, that's what they, they're looking for and that's what we can do. So I think that we can confidently tell parents that there is a safe pathway to allow students to get back into the classroom. Um, there's no guarantees, of course, there's no guarantees anytime you, you leave your house, frankly. Um, but what we've really been able to put together for schools, everything from the transportation perspective, extracurricular activities, whatever it might be, uh, parents should ha have confidence. Uh, in terms of, of allowing those, those kids to go back. Of course, the exception to that is uh, children. We always want to emphasize children with other underlying health conditions. Parents may want to make other decisions there. Um, and districts, again, will have the final say on whether that really happens or not. Um, I, again, for the few districts that may choose not to go back right away, um, that's their choice. But again, we've provided a guidance document and, and, and guidance through public health and our constant communication with those school districts to give, I think, all the confidence in the world that it can be done, it can be done safely, um, it can be managed. I mean, that's the most important part of this. Doesn't mean no one will get COVID in the school, but it definitely can be managed. And the overwhelming posit positive health aspects of being back in school, out of isolation, in a social atmosphere, um, maintaining both the mental health aspects and um, there's just so many health benefits to being back in that social atmosphere for kids. Um, again, we, we obviously we looked at all the different risks and, and avenues, but I think everyone across the board feels like it it, uh, it can be done and it, it can be managed and the state can be here for, for a resource. Districts are not on their own by any means. Um, they know exactly what the guidelines are. They have uh, some flexibility at the localized level. So the, the, de the final details, if you will, of mandated a mask here or not. I was with a, a group of kids this morning and, and a, little, a little girl asked me, um, she, you know, we're all wearing our masks and uh, it was a camp. Um, and the little girl said, well, what about at phys ed? Am I gonna have to wear a mask, you know, running around at, at phys ed? And I said, well, again, as long as you can be socially distanced and, um, and everything, your teacher will have the option to, again, allow that not to happen as long as he can maintain distance and the health and safety of the kids. But that's the, an example of the flexibility that folks want. But 
you know, 80, 90 percent of the parents in this state agree kids really need to be going back to school. The only folks that are, I think, pushing back, you have some union bosses out there that are, are, are making their list of demands and saying no, 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 across the country, frankly. Um, but, and, and that's a bit of a battle I think you're seeing at the local level between the, the union and the parents. Uh, but parents and, and many of the teachers, uh, I think, really appreciate getting back to classroom is in the best interest of those kids. And teachers know that they are going to have the tools to manage. Cool. Um, I just did a story today in in-depth New Hampshire about masks um, being mandated. Um, uh, I bought a story in where? In-depth New Hampshire. Oh, oh okay. Sorry, sorry, yes. sorry. Yeah. Um, about um, the Plymouth is considering a mandatory mask. Um, Durham, uh, Keene, um, Portsmouth, and Nashua, um, and I think Nashua actually has one. Um, do you s support individual communities making the decisions sure. to mandate masks? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if they think that's the right choice and it can be managed by those teachers in those classrooms and, and provide um, the health, uh, managed in terms of the health and safety, making sure, you know, if it's a, if it's a mandate, it, it, the, ki that the kids have to wear them, let's say, all day long. I don't know what the individual uh, mandates you're talking about are, but let's say it's a mandate saying kids have to wear that mask all day long in the classroom. If that could be managed in the classroom by the teacher, great. I would just caution, make sure that it truly can be managed and it's practical and you're not putting so much onus and burden on the teachers to manage something that can't be completely fulfilled. But if they think they can do it, and uh, more hats off to them. I think that's great. Municipalities looking at making it required for entering businesses. Or, or oh, you're or talking about entering businesses, not schools. Oh, that's yeah. fine too. Sure. Yeah, but, hey, look, they have the right to do that. Nashua did it early on. Other communities are, are doing it. You see businesses themselves uh, doing the mask mandate themselves. That's all fine. That's great. But you don't necessarily think that you want to do that on a statewide basis. Well, I understand a statewide basis is a very different situation. I mean, you know, like we said, uh, Manchester is not Colebrook and, and Plymouth is not... Um, you know, Pittsfield. Uh, everything is a little bit, a little bit different, and so those towns can make those decisions on their own because we are so different. We might be a small state, but boy, we're socioeconomically diverse. We're diverse in the, the level of COVID we have. We're diverse in the, not the, so much the resources, but the management systems that are available. You have some of these small towns that they don't have the big management public health systems that the city of Manchester does. Well, you got to appreciate that and, and respect that. And so each of those towns will have to find their path that they can manage and uphold around the public and safety guidelines that we've put forth. Governor, just to follow up on um, the schools, uh, in the NEA principles document, and there's been some other discussion of this, uh, the idea of HVAC systems and air circulation is, is important. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of the older school buildings in, in New Hampshire are still in use. Uh, to what extent has there been any discussion of perhaps using any leftover um, CARES Act funds to try and leverage some kind of school building aid again to help some of these older facilities maybe get a better air circulation yeah. system if this does continue. So we have talked about uh, making investments into um, if, not just schools, but uh, long-term care facilities as well, right? We know that exchange of air is a very healthy thing. Um, some of the systems in some of these uh, older facilities, and they could be a variety of different facilities, you know, we want to make sure they're cleaning out their filters. They have modern technology. They're making those investments. Um, they're allowing that air flow. So there's, there's um, uh, UV systems that can come into play to help clean the air and all that kind of stuff. So uh, we've discussed the possibility of creating some type of fund for that. Um, we got to make sure that, again, it's something that's achievable. Um, if those projects can go forward and be completed within the time between, you know, between now and the end of the year, it's something that we're definitely looking at, to be sure. But it could be long-term care facilities, it could be schools, it could be a variety of different different uh, places. Specifically long-term care, I mean, that's where the outbreaks are, right? You know, and those individuals in a long-term care facility, a lot of times they're, they're in one room or just a couple rooms over the course of the day. So getting that airflow in their like, air exchanges is really critical in, in those types. It's not an airborne illness as it hasn't been proven to be that yet. That's a really good thing, by the way. Um, it is, uh, it's aspirated really, but it's not truly airborne. So we're not at that stage yet, but, um, but anything to reduce the potential outbreaks in long-term care facilities is, is a benefit and something we're definitely looking at. Governor, New Futures put out a report this week that said revenue losses at substance abuse providers um, would equal up to $18 million in CARES Act funding. Now, I know many of these groups are nonprofits, but mm -hmm. are you looking at any I allocated six, I think five or six, seven million dollars into SUD programs a couple weeks ago. Yeah, so that's uh, that's already well underway in terms of helping them uh, recover some of those costs and and hopefully getting folks, the, giving folks the confidence uh, to come back into those programs. I think the doorway system continues to be a huge success for New Hampshire. Um, it's seeing more and more people all the time, and we're seeing. 
you know, the depressed numbers that we saw of people not coming into some of those facilities in March, April, May, uh, those numbers are starting to come back. That's a really good thing. That means people are coming back into their recovery programs. They're working with some of their um, their addiction programs and, and, and in a very positive way. So um, hopefully those numbers won't continue on the same downward trend, but we've already provided millions of dollars of relief and we always stand by to, to provide some extra relief if necessary. I know SAMHSA's put some additional money up out of the federal government. Um, I think there was an, a, a second direct federal government uh, uh, investment of dollars. It looks like the SOR grant, which was huge for us a couple of years ago, that will likely be re-upped again. So there's, um, you know, if you look at a couple of years ago, the state put about three and a half million dollars into SUD programs, substance misuse and, and disorder programs. And uh, I think over the last year and a half, we've put close to a hundred million dollars in. When you look at the federal support, what we've been able to do in tripling the state support to those programs, what we've been able to do with the CARES Act funds. So there's a lot of money into that system now. And that we're getting the results, right? The numbers are going down. The doorway system is providing better rural access to care. Um, all those things are much more integrated in, uh, into a network, much more efficient system. Still a lot of work to do, of course, but uh, we're not just throwing money at, at a problem the same old way and hoping for the best. That's the way it was when I, when I became governor. It's just the wrong way to go about it. We're being efficient about it, we're creating new systems, we're being innovative, and we're investing in communities that traditionally didn't have uh, some of those supports. And, and COVID has, has affected it, to be sure, and we'll continue to put dollars in if we have to. Just to sew up on the testing, uh, so if these rapid test machines come through, as the Vice President has said, that means that in New Hampshire will be major hospitals and long-term care facilities that have rapid testing capability? I believe so, that's my understanding, yeah. Is that, I mean, right now the, the most of the major hospitals have the rapid ID, uh, Abbott rapid test, uh, and this new device would, in theory, again, I don't have a list of every facility that would get them. They said 15,000, everyone's getting them across the country. So um, that sounds like everyone. When, when, when the federal government says everyone, I take them at their word. But we also hold their feet to the fire as well. So we'll see what actually comes of it. But I'm, I'm pretty hopeful. They were pretty confident that over the next five weeks, all these facilities across America, we're going to get these devices. That's a good thing. Is it fair that Major League Baseball, the NBA, they've got these machines and here we are still waiting for some? Um, I, well, I, I don't know about that. Yeah, dude, I don't know. How did they get, did, were those given to them by the government? I'm not I sure how they got them. The I don't know. Um, look, I think, I guess to simply say, I think healthcare facilities, long-term care facilities, um, and people that are on the front lines of the COVID problem crisis should get access to these types of devices and reagents first. Yeah. So. I guess in theory, it's it's not. I, I don't. I don't necessarily want to use the word fair, but it's. Um, I think um, let's let's get our priorities straight. You know, but I don't know how they got those devices. If they bought them themselves or they had other deals, I I'm, I don't know. But when it comes to the government providing a, a support, so obviously we want those supports to to go to the front lines and those at, at highest risk first in terms of the healthcare workers and those that are take, that are taking care of our loved ones. Are you gonna be watching opening day? That, is it tomorrow? Tomorrow's opening day, right? It's tonight. Oh, tonight. What's today? Today's Thursday already. I'm sorry. I'm totally forgetting what day it is. COVID. I got, I got COVID on the mind. Oh, so tonight's the big night. That'll be exciting. It'll be exciting. And I'm interested to see what happens with the NFL. They say some stadiums um, won't have fans. Some stadiums might have fans. I'm not sure. It's going to be a, a little bit different, but we'll be watching. All right. Well, it's great. I uh, hope everyone has a good weekend. I know there's a big storm on the way. Uh, in all seriousness, please, everybody be safe with that. We'll have a little, a little rain and a little wind. Um, buckle down, enjoy the lightning, and uh, hopefully we all get through it in one piece. And we will be back uh, next week. Have a good weekend, everybody. Thank you.